Well, hello everyone. I'm sure you're enjoying the beauty and bounty of spring. There's just nothing like it, particularly after this past cold winter. Today, I want to talk about one of my favorite subjects. It's a very broad one, but it's perennials. Those wonderful garden plants that come back year after year without replanting. I consider them loyal friends in my garden, and I bet you do too. We're going to talk about some of the more common ones, such as daylilies, iris, and peonies, but we're also going to talk about some new Johnny-come-latelys and also some different ways to go about planting perennials. So why don't we start in the past? How did our ancestors plant perennials? Well, they passed them along, right? Over the garden fence. Hey, I've got some of this. Let me dig some of it and give it to you. And they also were accustomed to ordering plants through mail order. Well, today, with so much being shipped around the country by people ordering online, the bare root mail order perennial business is bigger than it's ever been. So if you go to your local nursery, you'll get this much in terms of variety. Now, there are some, certainly some exceptions out there, some marvelous retail garden centers. But often if you go to a catalog where they're growing lots of different perennials, you'll get a much wider array of perennials as well as um, a lot of the new ones, the latest ones coming along, as well as some of the great old standbys, the, what I call the heirloom perennials. So going back to our ancestors, I remember my great-grandmother and my grandmother sharing plants that they had in their garden. These pass-along plants were just um, a part of, well, the community. You just shared what you had. And often people would just dig them up. And you've probably heard this about your grandmother or great-grandmother. She could just take a stick and stick it in the ground and it would grow. Well, there's a lot of truth to that. What I want to talk about first is this idea of getting a bare root perennial. And what we have here is a bare root daylily. Looks kind of like a little space alien, I know. Um, whichever, these nice tuberous roots, love the aroma of the fresh soil. And you can see the young daylilies beginning to emerge. Now, this particular daylily is one of my favorites. Uh, it's a fairly common one, and for good reason. This one's called Happy Returns, and I use it a lot because it only grows to about 18 inches, but it is a rebloomer. So it's a good front-of-the-border sort of daylily. I love mixing it with um, purples like catnip, um, like Walker's Low catnip. Uh, that beautiful sort of lemon, bright, fresh yellow against purple is really outstanding. So in this daylily, this is a very generous clump. And if you ordered a daylily like this, or you dug it out of your own garden and shook the soil off of it to transplant it, of which I don't recommend, if you're moving it in your own garden, leave the soil around it and just transplant it. And it's better to transplant when they're asleep. Not to say you can't move them any time of the year if you water and take care of them, but ideally when the plant is dormant, if you move it, that's the time to relocate it uh, somewhere else in your garden. But when you order them bare root, um, you'll see uh, they'll usually come in like this. You want to make sure that those tubers are, are nice and uh, turgid, uh, firm. And what I like to do with a bare root plant like this is to um, soak it in water before I plant it. So let's say three or four hours, maybe even six hours before I, I plant, I will sit this plant down in a bucket of water and let those roots rehydrate. I keep the crown, if you can, keep the crown of the plant, this is the crown, the top, above water, but just sit it in water and let it just sit there and those roots will absorb and begin to rehydrate. That gives it a little bit of a boost uh, from the time you take it out of the bucket and actually nestle it into the soil. I've planted thousands of bare root perennials and it is a great way to go about it because you're not lugging pots and containers and digging big holes and so forth. What you wanna do is you always wanna prepare a bed. You wanna make sure the bed has good uh, what I call friable soil, soil that if you squeeze it and you break it apart in your hand, it falls apart. Um, that's a true test for me. It means it doesn't have too much clay in it. And I like to nestle the, 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 the perennial, and I'm using a daylily, of course, in this example, where the roots are spread out 
like this. And then I pour water in the hole. Again, another act of rehydration. And then bring the soil just up to about where it would have been in the field where it was growing. And in this case, it'd be right about there. You don't want to bury them too deeply. If they've got a little crown, and you can usually look, no matter what it is, you can see that little stem or that little emerging bud. You want to just bring that right to the edge of the ground, just as it would have been where it was planted previously. Now, a clump like this is very generous. Now, you could take this Happy Returns, and I could tease that apart, and look at that. I could get two Happy Returns out of this. In fact, I could get three happy returns out of this. In fact, let's see if I can get four happy returns out of this by gently teasing it apart. Look at that, four. Four plants out of a single clump of happy returns. Each one of these, even though they're bare root, will flower this year. Now you want to get these planted as soon as possible. Daylilies, of course, love full sun. Many of us know that. But the daylily, if you're beginning in gardening, is probably one of the easiest flowers to grow. And you know, there are a lot of snobs out there. Let's just face it. And I know a bunch of them. Daylilies? Why would I put a common old daylily in my garden? Oh, give me a break. Some of the finest gardens I've ever seen in England have daylilies. There's nothing wrong with daylilies. They're absolutely fantastic. And they're edible. I love to eat the flowers and the petals are gorgeous in salads. Every part of the plant is edible. And it's a marvelous, marvelous perennial that comes to us from China. And um, there's so many different shapes and colors and forms of daylilies how can you say i don't like daylilies because they're just they're just too diverse these days they're spider types they're those with ruffled edges they're just a fantastic perennial all right enough about daylilies i know i'm getting on my soapbox about that so if you're a daylily snob do not tell me because i don't like that now let's talk about some of the other perennials for instance lavender who doesn't love lavender i like any kind of perennial that has an aroma right Fragrance is important to me. It's one of the things I always look for, particularly if you're designing a space where it's sort of close and intimate. Maybe it's a little patio just outside your living room or your kitchen. Maybe it's a place you like to go out and just have a cup of coffee. Fragrance adds so much to that experience. I think you would agree. Um, lavender, for me, is one of my all-time favorites. Uh, this is a Spanish lavender. In my part of the world, we have heavy clay soils, okay? So growing lavender is a challenge. Not every perennial is gonna be a walk in the park, okay? You need to choose perennials that work in your area. The daylily just about grows anywhere. That's why I started with daylilies. But I'm telling you, lavender is worth a try. Even though I live in a hot, humid, clay-ridden environment, I'm going to try my hand at lavender every year. You can count on it. Now, what I've learned, if I wanna grow this wonderful perennial lavender, I will plant them in containers because I get them up out of that heavy clay soil because lavender resents having wet feet. What do I mean by wet feet? Well, that's water gathering around and hanging around the roots too much. There are certain perennials that actually will thrive, like Japanese iris, for instance, or Louisiana iris. Many of the iris members of the iris family will take a lot of water, except for the beautiful tall bearded iris. You know the ones I'm talking about with the big gorgeous heads and blooms on them. Uh, but your typical sort of uh, Louisiana iris and even Japanese iris, they're, they're fine in water. And even cannas will grow in standing water. But lavender? They're on the far end of the spectrum. They really want to be on a restricted water diet, if you will, and you don't really need to fertilize them that much. Um, what I love about them, beyond the fragrance, is that they're really good looking in containers. And what I do is a really loose, sandy mix with my soil. I'll take a regular potting soil, which usually works because it drains very well, but I'll take uh, like three to four parts potting soil and add one part sand. And that makes sure that I get that sharp drainage around the lavender. And I always place a saucer underneath the lavender container because you don't want them to completely dry out, all right? The other thing is they prefer a slightly 
sweet soil. So if your soil is very acidic, uh, which ours is, which is another problem, you may want to add just a little bit of hydrated lime to the soil, which will sweeten the soil. Uh, what I found, believe it or not, one of the best lavender plants I ever planted, I took a concrete block that had two holes in it. I knocked the center piece out of the block, so I had a long sort of trough. I put two lavender plants in that, and those lavender plants thrived growing out of that concrete block because they were elevated, right? Because I made the soil that I packed in around the roots very loose, adding a little sand, and the concrete blocks were alkaline. They were made of lime, and so that sweetened the soil, and those lavenders really performed very well. I know concrete blocks are not the sexiest sort of material to use for a container, but it's a lesson for us all to learn. If you don't really care about what you know the aesthetics of the garden are and you wanted to do a small four foot square bed of lavender, think about using concrete blocks and border it with concrete blocks and then maybe put a veneer around the concrete blocks if you don't know if you don't like the way they look but the lavender will thrive in a situation like that and just like these daylilies the lavender is going to require full sun as you know i try to answer as many questions as i can uh, keep the questions coming we will try to get to them um, it's wonderful hearing from you and I've got a few that I'd like to share with you because I think everyone learns from other other people's questions. Uh, so this is Cheryl. Uh, she's saying my hydrangeas aren't looking good. Uh, they are from 1965. Wow, there's a testimony to the longevity of some of these great garden plants and only produced about eight blooms on each bush and the color was very light blue. What can I do for them? Well, um, it sounds like a, a plant that is that old um, may need to be root pruned. And what I would do is stimulate it by cutting the roots about two feet from the plant, uh, driving a spade about every foot apart around the plant to stimulate it. Make sure, Cheryl, you've cut out all the dead wood of that hydrangea, okay? I don't know what your feeding program has been, but you really need to feed that plant. If you're only getting a few blooms, I think bolstering it with an organic all-purpose fertilizer would be very important. One with a little higher middle number, that's phosphorus. That's where you're going to get your bloom set. You're going to need to do that in the summer so you'll see a lot of blooms the next spring, okay? So this year, this summer, Probably a little late now to see results because the buds have already formed on, on hydrangea macrophylla, which is what you have. That's that great old fashioned one. Um, you'll want to make sure that you fertilize it and feed it so when it begins to set those buds in summer, there's plenty of food there for it. Okay, if you want to bolster that blue color, because you mentioned color, one of the things you want to do is change the pH. Now, I've talked about this a lot, but it bears repeating. Um, the pH um, is, is really the soil chemistry. And what we want to do, the bluer the hydrangea, you want to go more acidic. So you'll want to put an acidifier, an, an acidifying fertilizer. You can buy this as a liquid or, or granular. Uh, it's acidifying fertilizers are for azaleas and camellias. Uh, and rhododendrons and hydrangeas if you want them to bloom blue. Uh, on the other hand, if you go sweet with the soil, if you add the lime to the soil, um, that's going to make it, the, the, the pH is going to become much higher and the blooms will turn pink. So if you're going for blue, go for acidifying that soil by using a, an acidifying fertilizer or just aluminum sulfate. Now that's not a food, it's just a, a compound that will uh, make sure that the soil is acidic and give you that blue color you're looking for. I hope that helps keep us posted on how that goes. Can't believe you've got a hydrangea since, since 1965. I'm very envious. Okay, so here's another hydrangea question. My hydrangeas used to be prolific. Now they seem very sad. I think I'm gonna cry. What would you do for them? What fertilizer would you use? Also, I'm in California, Southern California. Huh. 
This is from Phyllis. A lot of what I said responding to Cheryl applies here. Um, I'm assuming that maybe Phyllis's are recently planted. First of all, hydrangeas in Southern California, you got to give them some shade, Phyllis. You just can't put them out in full sun. North side of the house where they're going to get some shade is ideal. You go around these old places here and you see along the north side of the house, hydrangeas. The drip off the house gives them the moisture. The north side gives them that cool, shady side, and they just do so well. So siding is very important there. If you've got them out in full sun, they're going to stress out. Make sure your soil is very well worked up. They have fibrous roots, and you want that soil very loose. And humus rich, lots of humus in that, all right? And then just follow some of the directions that I mentioned about the fertilization. Uh, you're going to see your biggest blooms next year if you start now, okay? And get an all-purpose organic fertilizer. It can be in liquid form or granular or whatever you want and begin feeding them. And you'll know you're feeding them well when that leaf color turns really dark green. That'll be your sign. Okay? Hope that helps. People just love their hydrangeas. And why shouldn't they? I mean, I, I love them. Okay, so here we go. I want, this is from Casey, I want to move a bush and flowering tree in my yard. So that would mean uprooting them. What time of year should I do that? All right, Casey. Um, what you wanna do is move plants when they're asleep. We were talking a little bit about this earlier in the show with these daylilies. Um, trees and shrubs, I usually start moving those uh, as soon as they go to sleep and they begin to nod off once they lose their leaves. I'm assuming you have deciduous trees here. It's a flowering tree and a bush. What you want to do, um, let's say that you're going to move them this fall. What I would do is do some root pruning, okay? And I would take in three places and go around that trunk of that plant and I would drive a spade in in three places in a circle and I would drive that spade in and cut the roots, okay? And let's say that's one foot out from the trunk. Then when you dig it, I want you to dig an 18 inch diameter around the trunk. You see what I'm doing? You're establishing some feeder roots. Then lift that up, the soil and everything. It's gonna take a little work and move that over to the new site and do that in November and December before the weather gets really cold and then water them in and mulch them in. And usually you wanna create some sort of a stabilization so the wind doesn't blow them around. So drive a stake by them, tie them to it so that they're not getting knocked around and loosening the roots and the roots connection to the soil. The problem is you get a lot of that feeder, feeder root gets disturbed, they get torn. And then what I like to use is a root stimulator at that time. A lot of people say, why would you do that? Because it's already turning cold. Well, the soil temperature stays really warm, okay? So using a root stimulator, you wanna start getting those little roots going as quickly as possible. And depending on where you live, those roots will grow all winter long. Um, so that's, that's the best way I've seen to move plants. It's a very good question, because I'm always moving things around, so I know exactly how you, how you feel, okay. Here's one from Colleen Taylor. My sister bought a house last year and was elated to find one small peony bush from the previous owners. What can she do to make sure it flourishes this year and for 20 more? Well, I wanna take a moment and talk about that operative phrase, 20 more. This is the beauty of the peony, isn't it? If you are lucky enough to live in a part of the world where you can grow peonies. Uh, that means that you get a, a nice long cold winter um, from about zone eight is the limit. North is where you want to grow them. They'll do very well. Now what you want to do with that peony is feed it with an all-purpose organic fertilizer, just side dressing it. What I, what I call side dressing, if this is my plant, I'll just take and sprinkle around the drip line of that plant some organic fertilizer, okay? And as soon as those flowers fade, cut that bud off, all right? Because we don't want any energy going into making peony pods and seed. We want that foliage 
to last as long as it possibly can because that foliage is a solar energy machine. Through photosynthesis, it is taking light and it is transforming light from the sun into carbohydrates and they are building up the tuber of that peony and that is going to do nothing but inure to big, beautiful blooms for you the next year. Now, please make sure that that peony is getting at least six hours of full sun a day, all right? So if there's a tree encroaching on that plant, you may want to lift it and move it. And we just talked about moving plants. The best time to move that peony, if you have to, and I don't recommend it, they resent being moved, would be to move that peony uh, sometime in the fall, once it goes to sleep, and then nestle it over, and don't plant it too deeply, okay? This is the number one reason peonies do not bloom, is that people dig a hole, the peony settles, the soil fills in around those buds, and they won't bloom. They'll come up with foliage, but they won't bloom. So I always try to plant peonies a little high, and then they settle, and it gets just about right. And if you get them in a position like that, they will come back for 75 years. That's the wonderful thing about them. If you've ever been to cemeteries, you'll see old-fashioned roses. You'll see a lot of old-fashioned shrubs like the spirea that we have here and the uh, canomalies, the japonica. You'll also see iris. And, of course, you'll see daylilies and peonies. These are all old standbys. And people have planted them in honor of their loved ones. And in these cemeteries, these flowers have flourished without very little care. So to me, that's always a good place to think about. Let me check out the plants there because these will be the easiest for me to grow in my own garden. And of course, many of them are perennials. This is such a beautiful time of year and I just love the enthusiasm that I see in your, your messages um, on our YouTube site. Keep them coming and thanks for subscribing. Uh, you know, the, the perennial is a wonderful plant, obviously, because it comes back. But the beauty, the beauty of them is just really extraordinary. Um, we, we are moving at Moss Mountain Farm to more perennial planting and fewer annuals. And I think a lot of you feel the same way. Uh, we're all time oppressed and, and I hate that. And we want to spend time in our garden, but we don't want to be, you know, replacing plants all the time. So we're coming up with lots of combinations of perennials where, to me, it's like a, a, a play. You have actors coming on and off the stage. You get this crescendo of bloom at certain times. And so we're trying to work on perennials that bring that beauty uh, every week of the season. Some coming off and others coming on. And so working on that dance, that choreography is really exciting. And that's what I like for people to observe when they come to visit us at Moss Mountain Farm. We're open from the 1st of April until the end of June on Thursdays and Fridays. And you can make a, an appointment uh, on our website and um, we'd love for you to come. And then we pick back up in September, September through Christmas. And uh, the fall is a wonderful time to, to come to Moss Mountain. We also showcase um, perennials from Gilbert H. Wild and Son. This is a company that's been in business for, well, since 1885, strictly perennials. Uh, and so our gardens are full of what GHW or Gilbert H. Wild grows. Uh, they produce, these are, in fact, these are the happy return daylilies they, of theirs. You can see that's a single clump from Gilbert H. Wild that I divided into four. So they're very generous with the plants and the plants are uh, very unique. I'm excited to be helping them curate plants, look for new varieties of perennials that will um, add a little more design pizzazz in the garden, not just your regular standbys, but peppering it through with some new, what I call Johnny Come Latelys that are very striking. So thank you for following us on social media. Thank you for watching our PBS show, Garden Home, and our syndicated show, Garden Style. Uh, we appreciate all of you who've come to visit us at the farm. We love having visitors. And um, if you want to see this show, um, you can see it um, on YouTube. Uh, just go to YouTube, P. Allen Smith. Make sure you become a subscriber. Uh, we're posting virtually every day new content 
and we want to be there to answer every garden question you have. We'll catch you next time.